almost any story we broadcast this year. As we reported in November, there are several things that contribute to heart attacks. Diet, of course, is one of them. So why is it that the French, who eat as much or more fat than we do, suffer fewer heart attacks, even though they smoke more and exercise less? All you have to do is look at the numbers. If you're a middle-aged American man, your chances of dying of a heart attack are three times greater than a Frenchman of the same age. So it's obvious that the French are doing something right, something Americans are not doing. The answer to the paradox might be found here in Lyon. The city prides itself as the gastronomic capital of France. Food and its preparation are almost an obsession. Chefs have the stature of quarterbacks. But their preparations would send the American Heart Association into cardiac arrest. Butter, goose fat, lard, double cream are the staples of a decent day's cooking. Lyon, a city of just over 400,000, has 2,600 restaurants, 2,300 meat shops, 115 wine stores. Shopping is not a bore. People do it with gusto and care. Buying a chicken at the Lyon market can lead to a lecture on poultry, chicken feed, skin texture, and foot formation. Each bird is serial numbered and recorded, just like a Rolls Royce. It's all academic because the bird will soon be drenched in butter and cream and go the way of all farm flesh. The French diet, the paradox, has begun to intrigue foreign researchers. Among them, Dr. Kurt Ellison, a cardiologist and professor at the School of Public Health at Boston University. Dr. Ellison is launching a major study in four countries, comparing three nations' diets over a one-year period with the French. He is in Lyon to consult with French scientists and to have the odd good meal. I was just looking in this restaurant where I was having lunch. This is something you just wouldn't find in an American restaurant. <laughs> A Lyonnaise salad bowl, which is pig's head pate with parsley, black pudding, which, you know, is very fat, and potatoes in oil. Uh, double fat sliced tripe sautéed with onions. <laughs> and hot sausage with lentils and potatoes and oil. This is routine stuff. The farmers have been eating this for years. They've been eating a very high-fat diet, it seems, and yet they don't get heart disease. If we took the same diet and put it into an American, you know, we would all be suffering from coroners at an early age. There's something about the French that seems to be protecting them. And we're, and we're not sure what it is. We're looking for it. Dr. Ellison's reason for coming to Lyon is to study the findings at INSERM, the French equivalent of the National Institutes of Health. He met with Dr. Monique Astier-Dumas, a nutritionist from Paris, and the head of the Lyon Center, Dr. Serge Renault, who for 15 years has been searching for the answer to the French paradox. Do you think that the long history of French uh, gastronomy, of the respect uh, that French have, uh, the interest that France has for food, has something to do with it? Well, that that's could be. Uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, the people pay more attention to the food, uh, whether it is fresh, ready. They even they go to the uh, to the markets, uh, the, you know, to to purchase really fresh food, and consequently, the the meal itself is something that uh, takes time to prepare, takes time to eat, and uh, the attitude toward the meal is somewhat different. And I'm I'm convinced that something that should be uh, uh, taking into consideration. Dr. Astier Duma feels that the difference in eating habits, the fact that the French do not eat between meals, has something to do with the paradox. In France we have just three meals and that's all. And the main one is the lunch. In the United States generally, people are going to eat something every two hours. They are eating at breakfast, at 10 o'clock, at noon, at 2 o'clock, at 4 o'clock. Dr. Astier Duma does have a point. Americans do eat often and quickly and everywhere. The fast food industry thrives on our appetite for food that requires no knife, no fork, no spoon. One New York Emporium, Papaya King, boasts that the average time a customer spends ordering, paying, and consuming is 3.5 minutes. And this way of having something to eat all the day, 
I, I wonder if it is not one of the explanations of the French paradox. We still have problems with the United States because the very large percentage of our food is prepared, is manufactured, is processed, and we get it out of a cellophane package or a box or something. So we and we we, we zap it very quickly in our microwave. So uh, it's it's difficult to get you know to go out to the no. supermarket market and and but people don't do it. They don't but do it. It's not difficult for industry to put all the good things in the package. Most American nutritionists agree that dairy fat, including cheese, is a major enemy to a healthy heart. And here is the paradox again. In France, there are cheese shops everywhere and hundreds of varieties and textures, from triple creme to soft breeze and camembert. Each French man, woman and child consumes a full 40 pounds of cheese each year. Does cheese deserve its bad reputation? Dr. Renault says no. It is milk we must be careful of. Surveys in different countries show a very, very strong relationship between the intake of milk and the mortality rate from chronic heart disease. While for cheese, it's, there is no relationship at all. Dr. Renault believes it is the difference in the nature of calcium in milk and cheese. In cheese, perhaps because of fermentation, the calcium neutralizes the fat, combines with it, and it is then excreted by the body rather than absorbed. Whole milk, he says, promotes heart disease because the calcium will not combine with the fat, which is absorbed into the bloodstream. He's tested his theory on rats. And uh, here is our study with comparing camembert with milk. You see these uh, first two cages are camembert, and these one uh, are fed milk in comparable amount of fat and calcium. And his proof is in the rat doo-doo. The cheese-fed rats had eliminated virtually all the dairy fat. He also found that in dissecting the animals, the milk-fed rats' arteries were clogged, while the others were clear. It's a wonderful theory. Uh, he, has, he is the only one who's really doing research on this right now. As far as I'm aware, we're not doing any research on this in the United States right now. This is something new. And it's a very exciting uh, possibility to help explain this paradox. Yet, if you go to, to the north in France, there is not that much olive oil. They're using more there butter is no and olive cream. Oil, of course. And not. yet the rates are still lower there. Now, why are, why are the rates in, in Lille uh, lower than in, in Boston? Well, uh, my explanation is, of course, the consumption of alcohol. There has been for years the belief by doctors in many countries that alcohol, in particular red wine, reduces the risk of heart disease. Now it's been all but confirmed. The wine apparently affects the platelets, the smallest of the blood cells. It is platelets that cause blood to clot. They prevent bleeding. But they also cling to rough fatty deposits on the artery walls, clogging and finally blocking the artery and causing a heart attack. The wine has a flushing effect. It removes platelets from the artery wall. So the answer to the riddle, the explanation of the paradox, may lie in this inviting glass. It's, it's well documented that really an intake, a moderate intake of alcohol prevents for coronary heart disease by as much as 50 percent. I mean, this is... 50 percent? 50 percent. I mean, there is no other drug that's being so efficient than uh, a moderate uh, intake of alcohol. Of course, the problem is that uh, people are tempted to, to go beyond this moderate intake. When you say a moderate intake of alcohol with meals, what do you mean? Uh, I mean a, a few glasses of wine per day. If you're just sticking to that, you will never get drunk, you will never get any, apparently, any adverse effect of, of this intake of alcohol. Alcohol is a drug, and as any old drug, it has, been, it has to be given at a proper dosage. The intake of wine per capita in France is higher than anywhere else in the world. The United States intake is among the lowest. Wine in France is part of every lunch and dinner, and there is a dizzying variety to choose from. For everyday consumption, families simply drop into a filling station for a week's or day's supply. A number of American doctors, none of whom would go on the record, told me that if it was up to them, they would get rid of milk in school lunchrooms and exchange it for watered wine. The American milk habit, they said, is priming our 12-year-olds for heart attacks at 50.
And how old were you when you started to have a glass of wine with lunch or dinner? Oh, that's uh, very young at the age of 10, 12, but it was a little bit of wine and a large amount of water. Did you drink milk as a child? Uh, not after the age of five or six, I think. He feels very strongly that wine, taken in moderation, a couple of glasses with each meal, really is the answer. But he's hesitant to come out and say it, as you are too. Why is that? Well, I, th I think as a physician, we're all very much aware of the tremendous problem with alcohol abuse, with excess alcohol use. And we even know that from the heart point of, point of view, if you, if you if you have your three bottles of wine all on Saturday night, it's very bad for your platelets, it's very bad for your coronaries, it's bad for your, uh, for your health in general, as well as the health of others if you happen to be driving. On the other hand, if you spread out your three bottles and had uh, half a bottle every day uh, with your meal over several hours, it may well be that you're protecting uh, the heart by decreasing the stickiness of your platelets. If the United States is among the lowest consumers of red wine in the world, it is among the highest in victims of heart attack. About one million deaths per year. And the section of the country that consumes the least wine is known by doctors as Stroke Alley, the so-called Bible Belt, which ignores the admonition of St. Paul to Timothy, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine other infirmities. It makes it less likely for you to develop a thrombus or clot and have your, your coronary. There are a number of mechanisms that have been shown for, for moderate amounts of, uh, of alcohol. And that may be one of the factors, I think it probably will be one of the factors, whether that's the predominant factor, is surely not the only factor that's uh, making it possible for the French to eat uh, as, as you see they're eating and yet uh, and not have heart attacks. Uh, if the, you, you make that study, or if a study is made that proves more or less conclusively that wine with meals is a magic bullet, a, a protection against heart disease. You think that the American medical establishment and the American government, the National Institutes of Health, for example, are going to buy that? I'm not setting policy. I'm a researcher. I'm not a policymaker. But I think we should have the information if it is part of it, uh, part of the uh, explanation. I think we should know it. So I will get the answers and I'll let you talk with the policymakers to see how they deal with it. <laughs> the evidence of the benefits of alcohol in moderation keeps growing. As part of a continuing study, researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health looked at 44,000 Americans between 40 and 75 years old and found that those who drank light to moderate amounts of alcohol had a 25 to 40 percent less chance of developing heart disease. Moderate is defined as two drinks a day.